Hi everyone, this is Julia Alonji. I'm so glad to welcome you to this episode where we discuss uh, food regulation and uh, policies that protect consumers and also guide innovators uh, bringing food uh, products to the marketplace. You know, when you think about what you find on the shelves today, the innovative products that you find on the shelves today, by that I mean food, a beverage, or even the um, newer um, food types, food products like think about cultured meat, cultured seafood, different types of exciting products that we find in a marketplace today. Who regulates them? Who ensures safety for the consumers? Who puts a balance and, and control what enters the marketplace? Well, there's a regulatory body called the FDA and there's a particular office that, um, that is responsible for additive safety and ingredients uh, that enter into the marketplace. And we're fortunate to have the director of this office, um, Dr. Dennis Keith, join us in a conversation this summer at the Global Food Health uh, Innovation Summit. And I'll be sharing with you some <clears throat> excerpts from this conversation in this episode. I believe the information um, here is very valuable and it's something people should know. It gives you confidence that there are regulatory measures in place to protect you, um, protect consumers, and also innovators. You will learn what you need to do, action steps you need to take if you're planning to bring something innovative um, into the marketplace, especially when it comes to food and beverage. So join me and let's welcome Dr. Kip. Thank you, Julia. It's, it's a pleasure to be with you today and, and to talk to the, the people today on, online. Um, <clears throat> I'm the director of the Office of Food Additive Safety. Um, and this office is responsible for the pre-market review of ingredients that are intentionally added to food. And how we approach this responsibility in terms of safety is driven not only by the science, but by our legal authorities. And that is in, what's in the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And I'd, I hope to be able to, uh, during this session today, talk a bit about how we do that and answer questions about how we approach the, the safety assessments prior to market entry of new food ingredients. And by that, I mean things like food additives, color additives, uh, substances that are generally recognized as safe, substances used in packaging and food contact materials, foods derived from new varieties of plants, and also more recently, the, uh, the development of uh, the expectation, the attempt, the innovation of, of using cell culture of animal cells to produce uh, meat as a food source. So our, our office is, in, is involved with developing those policies as well. So it'll be, I'm, hope, I'm looking forward to a, 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 a vivid discussion today. Yeah, that, that's great. Happy to, um, happy to have you. So there was, um, there, was, there was a time I had a conversation with some investigators and we're talking about um, making um, specific recommendations. Now, this moves away from food a little bit. This is, um, you have a type of vegetable uh, that you feel like it has um, health benefits um, to people. Now you want to extract some things from that vegetable and make recommendations based on what you found on the lab. So one thing the person, uh, the, the investigator mentioned is that the FDA would not permit anyone to make rec uh, dietary recommendation that's medicinal um, in nature um, because any food that treats people, uh, make them feel better, is considered a drug, according to your office. And um, there was a bit of ambiguity when it comes to that. Um, now, does that change um, how we classify this? Is it going to be classified as food or no? Is that, is that where it draw, is there where it, is there a place where you draw the line in terms of this too? Because I know you have different offices that addresses different things. So where do you draw the line when it comes to, um, when it comes to recommendations to people um, and when it comes to recommendation of food or drug? So, so again, the, 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 whether something is a drug or a food, a food ingredient, um, is determined by the law, not the, the statute. Mm. FDA administers that. So if, if the statutory definition, if that particular use of that substance falls under the, sta under the statutory definition of a drug, 
and that includes not only the, the intended use, but the claims that are made with it, the law mandates that that be regulated as a drug. It's, okay. not, it's not up to FDA to make that determination. Okay. FDA looks at the available information and the way the, 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 uh, the uh, ingredient or the product is marketed and any claims made on it. Okay. So, right? So in the food space, it's very interesting right now because there is, there's a lot of innovation going on. There's a lot of, uh, as I think as one of your previous speakers was talking about, using plant-based foods and, and exploiting plants as a source of proteins as, as, an, as a source of other ingredients, perhaps using transgenesis uh, or introducing genes. We're also seeing the use of um, microbes to produce macro and micro ingredients uh, that have never been in the food supply before. So they're, mm -hmm. they're mining the, the sequence databases to identify proteins that have the particular technological effect they're looking for in terms of the foods they're making. So we're seeing uh, also uh, an explosion in innovative foods where there, people are trying to, or they're not just trying, they are developing foods without um, animals, for example. Mm -hmm. There are examples of uh, companies that are making coffee without coffee plants. Mm -hmm. uh, they, and, and, and they're quite popular. One of them is out on, in Seattle. Um, there are people who are developing uh, a way to produce human milk in culture mm -hmm. um, with, with, uh, with human cells, or, or they also tried with bo bovine cells to produce milk. So there's, there's an incredible amount of innovation going on in, in not only in the ingredient space, but in the uh, food space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, interesting. There's, there, like you said, there's a lot going on, um, a lot of innovation going on. So I'll move on to um, talking about cultured meat and um, mm -hmm. cultured seafood, which is um, one of the newest innovations that we're seeing on the market. It's exciting. However, um, but my question is, how do you regulate this industry? It's new, it's, um, it's exciting, but we have questions. For me, for instance, as a scientist, one thing I've known for so long is how um, our cell culture could be very tricky. Um, sometimes it works, especially when you want to do it at scale. Of course, when you're just starting and it's just a few, um, a few samples here and there, but when you're doing it at scale to fill the masses, how do you regulate something like that to ensure that um, you keep contamination down, you, um, uh, you do not expose people to uh, specific compounds that could be um, harmful to them, not just on the short term. I'm right? thinking if we continue consuming these products for over a pre prolonged period of time, what will be the impact on people's health? So, uh, and these are some of the things that you might not know um, until you see a large population size showing particular symptoms and then you trace it back to, oh, they all had this meal for this period of time. So mm -hmm. I was just thinking if there's any, uh, something in place to regulate this industry as they take off, because they are taking off. So, so all of the, Julia, all of the things you've mentioned are things we are uh, aware of and are looking at. Um, right. in, in terms of the the cell cultured meats. Uh, we are working closely with the developers. We don't have a, a specific policy in place. And what we're learning from the developers is that they are taking different approaches. And we are evaluating what they're, what they're doing and providing them guidance as they're developing the technology. And, you know, it, we're in the foods program. Um, Part of FDA, the Center for Biological uh, Research and Evaluation, CBER, um, is, is very much familiar with cell cultures and the use of cell cultures to produce biologics. So we do have knowledge within FDA to help us in terms of uh, developing policies around it. We're not there yet, I'll be honest with you. But, we're, and we, but we, are, we are actively working on this and identifying uh, where we think there might, might be safety concerns. And, and our approach, it, it just is, there's a parallel to this. Um, I mentioned that we, we, we also have a, a, a program for foods derived from new varieties of plants. Um, you know, back in the late 80s, early 90s, 
transgenesis, the introduction of DNA to plants to create transgenic plants was uh, really starting to develop with the first one being Calgene tomatoes. And, we, and in 1992, we published a, a, a policy framework on what we thought were the types of questions from a scientific perspective and also from a legal perspective uh, uh, that developers needed to address. And this sort of is a, it really illustrates sort of the, the challenges that we have as regulators. We have a law, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. The only authorities that are expressly pre-market authorities in the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act is the food additive and color additive petition processes. Everything else is post-market. So, you know, it's not, you know, it, we don't have the authority to require new plant varieties to undergo pre-market review. We don't have authority to have, you know, foods derived from cell-cultured meat to go under pre-market re review. But we do, have the, we do have authorities under the act to ensure that food is safe. And so we can work with industry to develop guidance, to develop policies, to ensure that these, these technologies are lawful, but also safe. But it's, 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 a, it's a process where it allows the agency to use the best available science to drive its decisions, um, unless, the, unless the statute has changed. Okay, so um, that, that is to this um, interesting question about uh, policies. I know that um, everything you do is guided by laws and, and, um, and established policies, but I was just wondering how flexible or, or how quickly can those things change? Because we have a food industry that is so dynamic we have a food industry that is changing at a very, very, very fast rate. Mm -hmm. So um, there, there may be need to change some of the po existing policies regarding um, uh, regulation for um, um, products that are just emerging in the market. There may be need for um, a lot of uh, modification of how things are done. Of course, some of these policies have been 50, 80, 100 years old and Things have changed over time. So I was just wondering if you could enlighten us on the process to change um, some of so, the established ways of doing things. In the so if, you, if, you're, if you're referring to individual ingredients, mm -hmm. um, I can talk about my office. My office has about 115 people. We have pre-market review programs for food additive petitions. And color additive petitions. These are formal. These are very formal rulemakings, and require uh, amendments and, and publications in the Federal Register. We do about six of those per year. Most of those are color additives, because um, I don't know if you want to get into the discussion, but there's no there's no grass exclusion or exemption for color additive uses. So if you if you fall under the, the your use falls under a color additive use, you are required to come in with a food additive a color added petition, otherwise the food is adulterated and, uh, and uh, unlawful. So we do five or six of those a year. Okay. Um, the grass notification program does somewhere, somewhere between 60 or 70, responds to 60 or 70 grass notices per year. That's a voluntary program, but that's, that's the way most new ingredients to get a response from FDA. The other program that we have is, is uh, the food contact notification program and we average about a hundred responses to, to food contact notifications per year all of these numbers i'm giving you is per, per fiscal year okay. so the, the program in our office is responsive but we have we have the resources we have um you know if it to we were being challenged and asked to develop policies and uh, not only in terms of the cell cultured meat and looking at the science of that but we're also looking to adapt our, our policies around new plant varieties and adapting to the, 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 the CRISPR technology and the, the genome editing technology right. as we go forward. Okay. And, and using our learnings from what we've learned from the transgenics technology to the genome editing technology and, and, and modulating our level of regulatory oversight appropriately within, within our statutory authorities. So it's, we're constant, we've been constantly evolving as a program since 1958. 
And of course, the statute from 1958 for food additives and 1960 for color additives is based on the uh, society's understanding at the time. I, I sometimes wonder if what the structure we have in place might um, delay innovation or, because if people have exciting um, innovation they want to bring to the market, um, especially in the food and, um, food and health space, but there are regulations that prevent or delay such things from coming to the market. I just, uh, I, I, it, it would be good to know how, um, how we can improve the process or how we can make the, the process more flexible. You know, when, when things are flexible enough so that we, we promote innovation, not delay innovation. Do, do you see where I'm going with this? I, I, I do see where you are. And I, and I think FDA does have a role there. And, you know, when, when, we're, when we're asked this question by developers, innovators, we always encourage them to come in and talk to us early in their development phase, mm -hmm. in their plans, so mm -hmm. that they can understand what the regulatory framework is for this intended use. Mm -hmm. And so that when, you know, so when they begin to, to scale up, they don't find out that, oh, sure I need a right. color additive regulation. I can't, I, otherwise my, my product is illegal. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this has worked very well with the new plant varieties. Um, and it actually is, is what we encourage for all of the programs, or the, whether it's the petition process, the grass program, or the food contact program, come in and talk to us before you put your dossier together. Mm. And actually, we, although the grass program is voluntary, we believe that it has value because it provides uh, the manufacturer with some reassurances that they're meeting their requirements for a safe ingredient. Um, and it, it is also important, not only domestically, but internationally, if they try to trade their food uh, overseas, whether it's Europe or Asia or Africa or wherever, South America, anywhere else. They're going to want to know whether it's lawful, especially if it's an innovative ingredient. And in fact, we've, we have worked. Um, our office is also responsible and is, has been the delegate to the Codex Committee, the U.S. delegate to the Codex Committee on Food Additives. And we've been very instrumental and helpful to our industry, especially the innovative industry, getting their uh, innovative ingredient, not only recognized in the, once it's recognized in the US, but recognized under the codex, codex process. So it's, it's recognized internationally so that it has some uh, status in food traded internationally. Okay. That's great. Um, and and your, your question, your answer was really on point, especially when you talked about innovators coming to you early. And um, that, yes. that, that's really valuable so that they know how, how far, what they need to put in, in place before they start, um, before they, they start um, developing their products. 